Well, we hope you're enjoying a number of virtual so far. So many things to see and I uh, hope it's been beneficial for you. I'm Tony Ndoro. Welcome. This is the segment where I get to chat to, uh, you know, one of the personalities or personality in the farming or agricultural arena. And I'm glad to say this time around, I've got uh, the CEO of Grain SA, Yanni De Villiers, who joins me now. Yanni, are you well? Thank you very much. Yes, Tony, thank you and cool. welcome to you. Yeah, because I'm, 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 I'm joining you guys, aren't I? That's really, that's really you should be saying welcome uh, welcome to me. But Yanni, how's it going so far? Are you enjoying Nampo Virtual? Because this is a new experience for, for you for you and I suppose the uh, agricultural uh, um, sector. Yeah, it's actually funny, you know, you don't smell all the Buddha wars and yeah. the dry flies and all those sort of things. And, yeah. you know, the people chatting along, it's a nice vibe outside the, the studio here. Yeah. But, I mean, we, we had this challenge, you know, initially we, we, we kicked the ball forward and we tried to, to postpone the date yeah. to see how the COVID thing is going to play out. And, and then eventually we got to a point where we said we have to make a call. It's not going to happen this year, you know, physically. Yeah. But what are the other options? And I think this is where the youngsters got up and, you know, make some plans. And, and here we are. And it, it's quite exciting yeah. to actually see. So the, those, the, the youngsters can be a bit useful once in a while. Very eh? much so. Yeah, yeah. One, only once yeah, in a you, while. You must just check them, you know, with the budgets and all those sort of things. But uh, for, yeah. for the new initiatives and things like that, it's yeah. great to have them. It's, it's been, it is fantastic. It is it's looking really, really, uh, really well. Let's, Yanni, let me go back, uh, talk about you on a, on a personal level. Let me go back to when you were young, which is, let's say, about just five years ago, Yanni. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And uh, where did you start first experience agriculture? Yeah, so my, my mother grew up on the farm and my, my, my grandfather was the, the, te the, the principal at, at Coffee Fontaine in the southern free state. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and my mother and father met each other. I think my father was grade, what's it today, 11, something like that. And mm -hmm. my mother was in grade eight. And uh, uh, then they got married. Uh, but then my father started working in the mines in Welcome. Mm. So, so, but every single school holiday, I went to my, my grandfather's farm and my uncle farmed next to him. And I had like nephews that was my age. And, and that's where I spent all my, my, my school holidays. We never went to the sea. Yeah. We, we always went to the farm and I just loved it. So, so that's, I, I, I think, you know, from my genes, but also I think from my experiences during the school holidays is where agriculture was, was yeah. part of, became part of did, me. Did you at some point think, I want to be a farmer myself? Uh, I, I always, you know, we, we grew up very poor, so I never dreamt of having a farm or nice. actually become a farmer. Yeah. I, I thought, you know, I, I can study hard and I can, I can earn good grades so that I can get a bursary or something like that because there was no money for studies. And that actually how it happened. And yeah. then when I got to the university, they tested me and they said, well, you should do something in economics. Yeah. And I said, but I love agriculture. And they said, well, then you can do agriculture economics. You know, that there was a subject like that. And that's how I became involved in that. Uh, but um, today, you know, I, you know, if I think about grain farming, this is a high risk business. You know, I'm not sure whether <laughs> I've got the appetite for that. Yeah. If I look at the risk that our farmers are taking to produce food in this country, I'm not sure whether my character would have allowed for that but it, it, it needs a lot of patience and a thick skin <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it really does seem like that uh, so you, you go to university you come out of university you've, you've got your degree you're focusing on uh, the commercial aspects of, uh, of or the, the financial side of, of agriculture uh, you delve into milling yeah yeah initially I started off with government because I had a bursary from from government mm -hmm. so um, and, and I was very fortunate I ended up with what today we call the the NMC the National Agriculture Marketing Council okay. they were the advisors to the minister and I was sitting on the wheat board you know I was I was like just coming out of uh, university and sitting amongst those old whims and all the, the sort of the millers and the bakers and and for three years I did uh, uh, cost investigations at the silos and at the mills and at the bakeries Mm. calculating the bread price and the bread subsidy and I become aware of the the macro picture of, of how government was approaching feeding the nation at that time with uh, bread subsidies and bread prices and, and all of those things um, so, so it, uh, it was quite interesting to me and then mm. the Millers bought me out of government I was three years at, at the Department of Agriculture and then I started off with the Chamber of Milling and then I learned about processing you know uh, yeah. milling and baking and animal feeds and, and, and those sort of things and I had the privilege just don't need to visit almost all sorts of factories that is in agro processing. You know, mm. poultry slaughterhouses. You know, the abattoirs, the the, the corn starch, uh, wheat pigs factories. You know, McCain's mm. 
potato factors. I, I went through all those sort of processing. And, 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 it's, and it's a critical part. Processing is critical because, uh, you know, everyone talks about Africa, uh, from a, not just for South Africa, but as a, as, a, as a whole, as a continent, we need to process more mm. instead of just uh, sending yeah. out raw goods. So, it, it, you know, you were in a critical part of, uh, of any economy. Yeah, yeah. and I think we, we've also learned now that the growth in agriculture, the, the job growth can actually come in the processing side, yeah. not, not necessarily in primary. I mean, for primary, we need primary to, to process, but I think that's where the opportunities today in, in the whole of the sector is. Yeah. So why did you decide to leave the milling side to go oh. and the, the farming side, the, the, where, the, where the hard work is? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I always said to myself, I'll never work for the farmers. I mean, they, they're a tough bunch and you know, you've got 6,000 bosses at the same time. Yeah. In the milling industry, it was quite easy. There were three, three or four big companies and, and they called all the shots in, in the industry, basically. But um, uh, I went uh, in 2008 when the world was having a food price crisis. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture asked me to accompany her to, to Rome, to the United Nations Food Summit Convention there in Rome uh, mm -hmm. at the FAO. And um, I was sitting there and I was listening to all the heads of state talking about how they're going to tackle, how they're going to double production to 2050 to feed the world. Yeah. And, and to me, you know, at that stage, I realized that there's going to be a lot of more white water mm. in the production side than in the processing side, mm. because the challenges are going to be on the production side. And, and especially Africa need to step up. You know, I was listening. There's not a lot of land available in the U.S. and maybe a little bit in Southern America. But Africa need to step up to produce more for the rest of the world. And the growth was in India and China and, and those places. And for me, it, it almost sounds like, yes, this hurdle is a bit higher than where I was at that time. And then in 2011, you know, the, the, the Grain, uh, Grain South Africa approached me and said, you know, am I willing to come and, and, yeah. and help them to, to tackle these sort of challenges? And I think that was for me, a, you know, there was also a spiritual side to it where I, I, I heard that I need to be in, in this space. Mm. Um, so quite challenging. Mm. Uh, it's not an easy job to, to do and to keep a lot of grain farmers happy and, and to make sure that there's food in yeah. the country. But um, yeah. this is how it became that I actually moved Thank from you, milling to, to the I mean, you, 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 you mentioned that uh, you, you heard. So uh, I'm, I'm going to say faith plays a big part in who Yanni is. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Now, I, uh, you know, I was, I was telling somebody else the other day, every year in January for the past, uh, let's say, 25 years, my family and I went, uh, we will go to like a retreat somewhere in the bush on the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, only us, there's no other people involved. And then we inquire of the Lord where, what is happening, what's going to happen in the, in the year to come. Mm, yeah. And for me, those things play a major role in how I approach the year. And if then something difficult happened, like the COVID thing, I'm quite calm in my heart. I know I have to run around and do a lot of things, but I know I've heard there's going to be a tough year, you know, and, yeah. and then I can, I can deal with it. And, and sometimes, you know, when, when there's a drought, I know that my role is to encourage people, uh, to help them and to encourage them to get through this year. We all know, you know, yeah. after a drought, one day there's some new rain and then the new season starts and, yeah. you know, all of those things. So in Africa, we, we, we used to those sort of things. But yes, faith play a major role. And, and, and as I, I would also say, correct to say, then faith sort of fashions your, your leadership style. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 I work from the, 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 the scripture and from the Bible and, and that is what I teach. Um, I'm not scared to, to say that, and, 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 and this is how I, I try and help the, the younger generation to also have faith. Yeah. I think in, in agriculture, you know, you, you almost don't have a choice. Now, I mean, you, you live close to nature, you, you're dealing with droughts and very severe conditions when it's felt fires and things like that. Um, you know, when, when you see a calf dying or things like, you know, those sort of things are you, spiritual. You, yeah, isn't it? yeah, you need to be close to nature and, and, and to, your, to your creator to actually understand that and to, to go through all of these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, you also mentioned, uh, you know, development and uh, when we look at South Africa, the, the way forward really is to develop young farmers. Is that something that you're passionate about? Yep. Um, so uh, I started off uh, about eight, eight years ago with what I call a grain academy. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, it's now a leadership academy for agriculture. Um, and, and the vision that I had was, you know, the, the, I had the privilege when I was young to meet all the old worms there at the wheat board or at the maize board. And, and, and this is where I learned, you know, then you keep quiet and you listen yeah. to the old worms yeah. and you, you get the wisdom there and so forth. And the younger generation never have this sort of opportunity. We don't have a wheat board and a maize board any longer. There are organized agriculture events and things like that. 
But, um, and, and then the networks. I, I've learned other people, and you build networks, because agriculture is about relationships. We, we, yeah. we, uh, this is why we struggle so much uh, during this COVID period. We, we can't see each other again and you know, just find out what's going on on your yeah. farm and all these sort of things. So, so I, I, I noticed that sort of, yes, you have to develop leadership. And then the second thing is um, uh, you, you need to build new networks, especially for these younger farmers. The farms are getting bigger in South Africa. The farmers are getting lonelier because they, you know, out there in the middle of nowhere. And, and these sort of things. So we got like small groups together. We trained them well in terms of leadership, do like a brain profile thing and personality things of that. And then it is a mixed bunch of people. Mm -hmm. You build trans transformational stuff, you know, yeah. that, that the generations start talking to each other and, and that it's, it's, you know, farmers younger than 35 years of age. Yeah. So a little bit less hang ups than us in the past. <laughs> and, and then we said, and we put the real challenges in front of them. You know, how do we resolve the land reform thing in South Africa? Mm. And then this next generation have to start talking to each other about this and listening to each other's stories. And I mean, that, that becomes very emotional. Yeah, you yeah. know, when, when you hear where somebody else is coming from and this guy thought, well, this is how you look like and, you know, all mm. these sort of things. So the, the, that in, in, in one hand. The other hand is we also need to take those new farmers, especially our black farmers, mm. that has not been exposed to the technology that you see around here and, and, and in the seed and in the practices, and, and how to manage moisture. Now. I mean, with a dry continent like us, you have to learn how to, mo uh, to manage your moisture. So those are two areas. And I've been also the, the, the young scientists. Now. You know, agriculture wasn't that appealing to, to the younger generation. They go to computers and all that. Now they see we make food with computers. So all of a sudden you can bring in these <laughs> sort of data science Cause, people. Because you, you believe in research a lot. Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of it. Why? Uh, well, th this is the only way that you can improve your productivity. Now, you, you need to understand better how to deal with diseases, how to moisture, you know, deal with your moisture, and what sort of new varieties can we use to produce what? Now, yeah. certain maize varieties are better for starch production, others are better for millipop and those sort of things, and, and others for poultry feed. So we need to understand those things. And, and, and I think that the globalization also increased the risk of having national diseases like we have with this COVID thing there. I yeah. mean, so, so South Africa also need to be having capacity and young people coming in with new skills to make us understand our food systems better. Uh, COVID-19, how has that changed uh, Grain SA? Let's talk about your position as CEO of Grain SA. Have you had uh, uh, to sit and reflect and say, listen, maybe the world is changing. Has this given you maybe an opportunity to assess what Grain SA is and maybe map a new way forward? Has that happened at all? Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we're forced to do that. I think agriculture was fortunate to be an essential service. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we could have, you know, continue with a lot of the stuff. Um, uh, business as usual, although there were some limitations in, in a lot of instances. But I mean, as a company, we had to sit down and say, all right, you know, we can actually, you know, we spend a lot of money on traveling costs to get the farmers to meetings, you know, mm -hmm. from all over the country because we produce down in the Western Cape, you produce, you know, up in the Popo, whatever. So we, 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 and now all of a sudden we, we're forced to do virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. And initially, mm -hmm. well, it started off a little bit this, that, and the other, um, but it's not the same. You know, they, there's not all these interjections by farmers. You know, when somebody starts talking in yeah. a meeting, they, they've got this culture of interjection and you know, all these sort of jokes and things like that. Um, so you miss a, a lot of that. But yeah. I think as an organization, we need to look differently. Uh, but in the end, you need to take soil and you put seed in it and you produce food from it. Th yeah. Those sort of you know, fundamentals are not going to change because of COVID. But I think the way in which we manage things and, and having meetings, I think that in the future will definitely have a, a, a new new yeah. jacket. Organized agriculture, when I say, you know, what are the benefits of organized agriculture? Yeah, I, I think, you know, where we add a lot of value to farmers, one is we take a lot of responsibility to, to do negotiations, let's say with government. You mm -hmm. know, when you talk land reform, you can't have it with one single farmer down there in the middle of the free state or something like that. Yeah. When you talk international trade, you know, to find new markets, to, so we want to export our, our maize to China or to Indonesia or whatever, those sort of things you, you need a collective arm to do. When a single farmer have a problem with, let's say, fertilizer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a big company, and now there's one guy have to try and fight this big company, so sometimes we provide that muscle or that sort of 
uh, you know, give him just, a, we've got a specialist in the office that can look after that, that can help you with your dispute. We don't get involved, but we just help to facilitate the, 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 the let's say, taking samples and check the stuff out, whether it was a good quality or not, and those yeah. sort of things. So, so I think those, and then obviously research. Now, for those farmers, we need to know what is the need of down at grassroots level, and then yeah. find money and find the researchers to do the job right and get the information back to the farmer. I mean, mm -hmm. that you, you need organized agriculture to, to help with that. And then obviously, you know, when we look at the developing of our new farmers, if there's not a, a sort of a joint effort by, by a group of people that takes responsibility for that, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, so, so I think for those things, uh, organized agriculture plays a major role as a link between farmer and government. Um, you, you speak of uh, the upcoming farmers, uh, looking at subsistence farming in, in Africa and South Africa, that's, that's huge. You know, yeah. most, uh, most of our population survive in that manner. Are there instances where you take a, a good subsistence farmer and say to him, listen, you know, you're doing this amazingly well, let's just maybe show you how you can get to that next level. Yeah, so, so we've got a huge program on that uh, for the past 20 years. I think there's about 14,000 of those farmers in, in that program. Mm -hmm. We've got like nine extension offices, if you like, in the production areas. Um, so the one category is like the subsistence guys, there's sort of one hectare farmer. Yeah. So, you know, we know that the potential for that guy to become a commercial farmer is not that big, but we can get him from one ton to five tons on that one, one hectare. So we, we introduce technology to him. We don't allow them to plow any longer. They, they, they find it very difficult to understand. They don't have to plow. They use this conservation agriculture methods that all the commercial farmers are using. And then all of a sudden, you change a life when they get five tons and they can't believe it. And I mean, you know, then you will ask the, you know, what have you done with the extra money? They tell you that I bought a bed or I bought new yeah. clothes for my kids and, for and school. And that means a lot to Man, you change people's it? lives. It's big time. Yeah. Th those yeah. things are, are really where South Africa is changing. And I think that we're very proud of getting that. Then you get the guys with the bigger hectares. Now, the, the difficulty for them is if they don't own the land, they can't get finance. And yeah. yes, and this is where, again, organized agriculture can play a role because we can muscle and go and sit with the banks. They're very tough on this. But, uh, you know, or finding some additional funds that we can help them to, to co-fund and to just get them to get a proper yield and make enough money to the, buy the next season's inputs again. Mm -hmm. Those things are, are, are uh, we're very happy with the progress that we make. Obviously, you want to scale yeah. it up big Anymore. time. Yeah. But uh, this is how we can help Africa to, to produce commercial yields, yes. I discussed with you, you know, when you look at farming as a whole, and I mean, I, mean, I, I hear you pick up, you know, you, you seem, you know, with a smile on your face, you're talking about developing into about subsistence farmers and so forth and getting them to that next level. It's almost you have to balance profits, isn't it, with the social needs when it comes to farming? Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the sustainability of farming is, is our first priority. And sustainability means you have to make profits, you have to develop mm. the people and you make sure you look after the planet well. Th those are the fundamentals that, yeah. that we are as an organization stand on. But, but you, 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 you're right. Now, uh, this morning we had a discussion with one of the big input suppliers who is supporting us financially to help social projects, mm. where we understand that that one hectare farmer will never be sustainable to, to have enough funds from his surplus to, to, to pay for the inputs for the next season. Yeah. Full, I'm talking full. So, so what we've done is now, we've looked at what the European governments are paying their farmers <laughs> to produce. Now, and they, they get like a 30% subsidy. And we said, well, if we look at the farmer from a social point of view, maybe if we can help him with 30% and he can pay 70%, you know, yeah. taking that sort of example, maybe that is for social purposes sustainable. But if you change that household food security, you're going to change people's lives. Uh, so, so that we need to con continue. And, and we, we're very appreciative of people that we know, you know, relationships, yeah. and, and that is helping Grain South Africa to actually achieve something like that. And that is helping the country a lot, I think. And I think one of the key relationships, I'm sure, that you, 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 you have to uh, nurture is with commercial banks, uh, even government to a certain extent, your land bank and so forth. Uh, because everything that we're speaking about now, except sus subsistence farming, needs finance. Yeah. And a lot of that finance has got to come from the institutions I just mentioned. What's your relationship like with them? Yeah, so, so you know, we have to have good relationship with them. But obviously, you know, they, they also run by these regulatory stuff. Mm. Um, they, they can't do reckless lending. And, the, you know, this is the, we always hear this story. But, I mean, farming... And that is what we plea, of course, that we, we're a special category. You know, they, yeah. they have to help us. But I mean, I, I've seen the banks, you know, when there's a drought, 
they, they, they co help farmers to consolidate debt and they, they you know, carry it over. And I think everybody understands that. There. But, but somehow um, you as a banker or the financing institutions, they, they have to look at the sustainability as well, the, the repayability. Yeah. And, and for that, it's tough in South Africa. Now. We, we don't get a lot of support from government. Uh, to, uh, as far as the subsidies or things like that is concerned. So, so they are also carrying the risk with us. But um, yeah, it, it's tough, but we have to have that relationship. But they, they yeah, they, they, they're supporting yeah. us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yanni, let's look five years, your crystal ball. Okay. Uh, let, me, uh, let me not say that. Let me say, what does uh, your faith tell you in the next five years? What, 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 what do you want to happen? What do you wish to see? Well, I, I'm about to, to retire now, uh, you know. So You're still so young. Uh, well, I might look like that, but, you know, <laughs> I've worked for farmers. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, um, I, I think, you know, in my life, it, uh, the, the whole mentorship thing and the development of younger leaders have, 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 have uh, weighted very heavily on me. So mm. um, I would love to see those youngsters coming up and taking the, the responsibility. And, and, and with their potential and, and maybe less baggage, I, I, my, my dream is that, that they will take the country forward, that they will maintain the food security status of this country. You know, South Africa is almost the only country in African continent, continent that is food secure. I mean, we, we're the highest rank in Africa, but I think we're also the, the country with a the, with the, with the positive as far as that's concerned. So I would love for those youngsters to, to come into the decision-making positions mm -hmm. and to see them working together. And I mean, when, when, when these sort of leaders meet and they, they start, you know, listening to each other's story and they, they said, but, you know, we can take this country forward. I mean, th that for me is, is the positive thing. So one is that we remain food secure. I think I'm also dreaming of, of a better cooperation with the government. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're so far apart in terms of mistrust and 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 and, and that doesn't matter how hard you work there's always somebody with more baggage that that yeah, is yeah. messing up the relationship and and, and and the moment there's mistrust then then we can't cooperate that well and and i've seen you know for instance when we got to the minister's office with, with when COVID happened yeah the cooperation was out of this world and i thought yeah, it can always be like this, yeah. you know, and, and, and this is what I'm dreaming about, that the, the mistrust will disappear and that, the, you know, working at grassroots level, making sure people have got food must, if you've got a common goal about that and a common vision, it, the cooperation must get better. And that's what I'm dreaming about. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm raising and helping raising people that can live that dream yeah. and, and not having the same troubles that I had, you know, to build bridges with that so far apart, you need a hundred pillars in the middle, you know, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, you need a hundred pillars. Let's talk, lastly, lastly, Yanni, uh, what do you do in your free time? Oh, I love my wife. So I don't play <laughs> golf. <laughs> I don't so, play. So I'm, yeah, I'm I, I, I agree with you because I'm not allowed to play golf either. <laughs> so I fully understand where you're coming from with that one. No, uh, um, no I, about five years ago, I bought a small piece of land mm -hmm. for two purposes. The one was for recreation mm -hmm. and because I love the land. And the second one was that no farmer should tell me I'm negotiating land reform stuff for them not knowing how they will feel if I lose the farm. <laughs> so so um, for me yeah. uh, at the moment, uh, I love to, to, to hiking, walking in nature. Um, I love reading. Uh, I haven't read uh, as much in the last three, four years, uh, but I love reading uh, leadership books and, and, mm -hmm. and trying to, 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 to develop my skill more about that. And, and then the recreation part is, is going to the farm and work with my hands. Now, I mean, uh, I, I, there's, there's no uh, electricity there. Yeah. There's no labor there to help me, but, but I love to, to do, and even if it's slow and if it's crooked and I've never <laughs> bolted in my life, but I've done it now. Yeah. So, so that is uh, for me uh, important things. And, and I mean, I love to spend time with my, my family, the, the close ones uh, and so forth. And yeah. I've got a cell group at church that we, that yeah. we have um, friends uh, that we, we, we build our relationships with. All right, fantastic. Yanni, lovely and I love to watch sport now. Yeah. I, I, I might not look like I, I can do a lot of sport. I did it in my younger days. Yeah. But I, I'm a, which, I'm which sport? What sport? Um, no, I love the cricket. Mm. Uh, and and I, I love at the moment the Tour de France. I watch uh, you know, oh, the yes. strategy around the teams. Yeah. It's always yeah. interesting to me. And, and, and rugby, I'm more on the catch-up than the, the longer version nowadays. Yeah. Uh, uh, and athletic.
athletics. I mean, but I, I'm a very big sport uh, yes, spectator. Right. So yeah. Look, sport is wonderful because you can just throw yourself in it. Yeah. Forget the rest of, you know, you're, you're, you've been in the office for the whole week. Yeah. Just watch a bit of sport, your yeah. life will I be love, fine. I love to wind down on that. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And then on Friday evening, sometimes yeah. <laughs> we build puzzles. My wife puzzles. and I love to build the puzzles. Yeah. Like good old like, puzzles with yeah, the, the, yeah, but, the physical but, puzzles. But, yeah, but, but like uh, 2,000 pieces <laughs> and those sort of things. Uh, yeah. It takes us about a weekend to finish them. But that's also for me a little bit of winding down and mm. not thinking about everything. But know. but it's together time. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Because you're sharing that. Less you're really music that. and yeah. you know, sit together at the table and do that until mm. it's finished. Yeah, it's lucky. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful. Yanni, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, good luck. Uh, with, 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 with the dream, we hope it actually you know, becomes a reality because you made some fantastic points in that one. Thank you very much, Tony, and thanks for being here. All right. Uh, so there it is, uh, Grant S, a uh, CEO, Yanni De Villiers, talking about himself and the fact that he loves to do puzzles with his wife and he doesn't play golf just to spend more time with his wife. So uh, if you haven't learned a single thing, that's some good advice. All right, I'll see you next time here and uh, keep enjoying Nampo Virtual and uh, we'll have some more interesting guests later on. Bye-bye.